Welcome to Start Canada Podcast, where we interview startup founders, innovators, and thought leaders from the heart of Canada who are challenging the status quo, scaling their business, and bringing new ideas to life. Tune in with me, your host, Margot Miller, to hear firsthand exactly how they did it. Start Canada Podcast is powered by the Manitoba Technology Accelerator and Tech Manitoba and sponsored by Scotiabank. In the next episode, we speak with Ben Buckwald, CEO of ESL Library, a company empowering language teachers to teach their best class every class with exceptional content and courseware for all ages and all levels. Think lessons to flashcards cards and resources, but what sets them apart is their custom platform that provides the most relevant resources by combining machine learning with author-driven curation and it is for this reason that ESL Library is used by language teachers in more than 10,000 schools around the world. So in this episode, CEO and founder Ben Buckwald speaks about understanding how to grow your team, knowing when to pivot, and the importance of customer service and user experience. If you're building an online resource-based business or you want to pivot to one, be sure to tune in to this episode of Start Canada Podcast with the founder of ESL Library. Ben, welcome to Start Canada Podcast. Thanks very much, Margot. So happy you're here. Start by just telling us, what is ESL Library? What are you up to? So ESL Library is a subscription-based resource site and courseware site for English teachers around mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. uh, English is a second language. Uh, teachers pay an annual subscription fee, and then they get unlimited access to the content. We create new content every week, add it to the site. And it's meant for all ages, all levels, or there's a variety of content for all ages and levels. And it's meant to either uh, complement your textbook or to re re replace your textbook in the classroom. Okay, interesting. So now, is that too a part of why people are coming to you for the, this subscription service? Because you are constantly updating content, like you say, every week. Like, is that a big part of what makes their job a lot easier? Yeah, so, I mean, particularly in language learning, it's really important to have current content. So if, you, uh, if you're trying to get to a level of fluency, uh, it's best if you're talking about things that are actually happening right now as opposed to maybe something that was written in a textbook several years ago. You want to talk about current relevant issues. And so we create a lot of content that's really up to date. Things that may have happened in the news yesterday might be in a lesson uh, today or tomorrow. Uh, that gives students the opportunity to talk about things that are actually happening around them. And that's sort of the most realistic and uh, natural way of, of learning a language. So we focus a lot on that. But we also obviously focus on all the fundamentals like uh, grammar and foundational English as well. Mm -hmm. So, and how was this, how did this become the topic that you wanted to personally tackle? Like, where'd the idea come from? Because of course you can go on Google, you can find a lot of resources, right? But you thought, I'm going to make the best possible resource area. Why? Well, I mean, it started with uh, teaching English first. I went over and taught English in Japan after university. And um, when I was there, uh, I, I taught both in, in, in business uh, courses where you'd go and teach at schools like Hitachi or Mitsubishi or Sony. You'd go and teach at the campus of a, uh, of a big company. Uh, but then you'd also uh, teach privately in the evenings. Uh, and almost everybody who wanted to learn privately typically wanted to just have conversation and uh, speak about things that were going on because they learn English their whole lives in Japan from the time they're in kindergarten right through to, uh, to the end of high school. Um, but they never really get a chance to speak uh, to anybody and to really use that language. So there was a lot of conversation schools there. And that was where this idea sort of uh, came from. It was to create conversational-based content, but it grew, the library grew quite significantly uh, over the last number of years to have uh, content for all different uh, levels, ages, and reasons and purposes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So take us from being a teacher in, in Tokyo, you said, in, in yeah. Japan, to starting the actual business. Like, did you start it as a side hustle? Was it a secret project? <laughs> like, how, did, how was it born? Well, um, like a lot of language teachers, like most language teachers, you, you spend a lot of time in the evening 
creating the lessons yourself. You, you've got some materials that you can use, but you're often expected to create your own content mm -hmm. um, and you're not paid for that. So you're spending the time in the evening and that's the same with most teachers uh, in any subject. They're spending a lot of time in the evening uh, doing work, uh, creating materials that they're often uh, not paid to create. And so we used to spend a lot of time in Japan, myself and my roommates and, and friends, we would look for material online, but this was, I, I, I went to Japan in, um, the mid nineties. And so if you can imagine, you know, what the internet was like back then, there was very little stuff online. There was some Yahoo, uh, forums and boards and stuff where language teachers would post things, but there was very little commerce on, um, on the internet at that time. Uh, and we would look for materials of other teachers posting things, uh, and nobody really had any quality stuff. So, uh, all of us had to write our own materials. After being there for several years, I had sort of amassed uh, a number of materials that I had written myself. And as I started to see newspaper companies start to move towards uh, online subscriptions back then in the late 90s and sort of create that paywall, um, it, there, there seemed to be this opportunity to do the same for content for language teachers. And so um, I started to put together the idea of creating uh, a subscription-based service, which was actually kind of a hard sell back uh, in the, back in those days, we by the time I got it off the ground, it was 2002. But that was still a really hard time to to try to convince people to pay on a subscription model for content. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So I imagine you have to build quite a bit of trust, right? Like prove that you're going to actually have new good content that's worth the subscription and coming back every month. Was that part of the struggle? Um, well, so in the beginning, we, there was only 40 lessons on the on the site at the time, and uh, the quality wasn't that great either <laughs> at, at the time. Uh, and now there's over 1,500 lessons uh, on, on the site. Uh, but back then, it was less about how much content would be added weekly and more about just trying to get people to understand the concept of paying for content online. In that general. Was, in general, uh, pulling out their wallets and, and, and not only buying something online, but also uh, giving up their credit card to be held in trust by us for a recurring billing uh, subscription that was still pretty foreign back then. There was no Netflix, no Spotify, and so people just weren't used to that in their daily lives, let alone in uh, uh, in their work lives. So um, that was the harder sell then. Uh, but we built up a, a, a big enough uh, following that really liked our content, and um, uh, it was enough to just keep going and making new content uh, weekly. Mm -hmm. And eventually, we got to a point where uh, at first it was just myself, and then eventually it got to a point where I could afford a writer and then eventually an editor and then an illustrator and then eventually sort of a full pu publishing team had formed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you always know that you wanted to kind of start your own business? Was that always kind of a goal in the back of your mind or did, did you just kind of see an opening, start moving toward it and all of a sudden here we are? Uh, no, no, I, I think I, yeah, I think I always wanted to go into business in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, I had some businesses when I was younger as a teenager and um, commerce and business was sort of a part of my family uh, growing up as well. So I had a, uh, a desire to do that. So I came from a family of both uh, business people and, and teachers. Uh, so I sort of fell into both of those things together. It worked out well. Yeah, so this well. kind of sounds like a perfect fit in the end. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the, the platform originally is relatively straightforward, right? You have content on there. It's static to some mm -hmm. degree, like you're uploading the 40, but they're there. Um, Eventually, you move to this like much more kind of robust, evolving platform. The tech behind creating a good platform like that can set people back. How did you know how to do that part, or did you have help? What, what was that transition like? Uh, we didn't. Uh, we didn't know how to do that. <laughs> um, so everything was very gradual in this business. You know, we started with. Uh, a small collection of content and gradually grew that content library. And over time, you started to get requests from teachers for certain features. You know, in the beginning, the platform was very simple. It was just, you pay your subscription fee and uh, then you have access to a library of materials that you can, of PDFs essentially, that you can print out and photocopy. Um, but the more users that you get using the platform, the more requests you get for different types of technical features. So for example, like wanting to save uh, lessons to a folder so you can start to organize and plan uh, your curriculum. That was you know, something that we didn't have in the beginning. So you start getting these little requests 
uh, for features. And before you know it, you're building tools just as often as you're building the content and you're reacting to that in kind of real time as well. So we didn't necessarily set out to be a tech company or an ed tech company uh, in the beginning. We were an online publishing company, uh, but uh, it ju you just kind of fall into it. And I think everybody's a tech company now nowadays, but uh, you just kind of have to be. Yeah, 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 you're totally right. You do have to be to evolve and kind of keep up, right? Yeah. So now do you have kind of permanent people on your team that are responsible for that kind of user experience, user interface side of things? Yeah, so probably up until about 2016 or so, we used to outsource the development of our website. Uh, because it wasn't that sophisticated, we, we could you know, we had a, a platform, a subscription model, and uh, an uploading tool and a few other features. And most of the additional features we could outsource. And we had people, at some point we had people in Winnipeg, um, some companies in Winnipeg working for us. Uh, eventually we hired uh, some people outside of Winnipeg, all on contract. But around 2016 is when we started to hire in-house and uh, and start to build a team. And that was a tough uh, thing at first because we didn't, we, we knew a lot about publishing, but we didn't know really anything about building a technology team. Did you end up kind of going to the community for resources or support or did you just figure it out amongst your team? Uh, in the beginning, uh, I didn't reach out to anybody and I didn't even really know there was much of a community here. Um, uh, so we actually released... Uh, our first iOS app a month after the App Store opened in 2008. Uh, oh. And we were the very first, uh, without exaggeration, um, ESL English learning app in the world. Uh, it, came out, uh, it came out four weeks after the App Store opened. And I had been following, uh, do you know the site Mac Rumors? Uh, I don't think so. Okay, so it's like, I think that site's been around since 2001. And I read it every every morning just for fun. It's just kind of fun to see what's happening at Apple and what, what's coming out. And back then they had been talking about for the year from 2007, uh, when they released the iPhone up until 2008, uh, they had been talking about this rumor that Apple might release an app store um, and what it could look like and how it might look like some of the apps that were already on there. Like, you know, it came with apps from Apple, like the calculator and the calendar and these types of things. Um, and so I had an idea of how these apps might work. And um, we got ready and prepared for this in advance and had a, a whole content library ready to be turned into an app. And when we, by the time we got it up, uh, there were 500 apps in the educational section of the app store four weeks wow. later, but not one of them was an English uh, learning app. And that was entirely outsourced, the development of it. Um, but it did very, very well for us. Uh, it sold, I think, about 200,000 copies. Did you have a price and, for it at that point? We, yeah, it was $5 a piece. And we sold uh, just around 200,000. Um, and it, I mean, one of the reasons was that it... It was, there was no option. After about three or four months, there started to be other uh, competitors, obviously, and then it uh, exploded to having, you know, hundreds of thousands of English apps uh, on um, uh, online. But regardless, the, the point was, going back to your point, um, uh, even back then when we were making that, we didn't know any, that there was any community in Winnipeg uh, to sort of lean on. And so we sort of went outside of Winnipeg and we made a number of those apps over the next few years. They did quite well. Um, and it wasn't until around, uh, maybe it was 2012, 2013, that I started to hear about organizations like New Media Manitoba and um, uh, all of the support that was coming out of the Manitoba government uh, mm -hmm. and how there was a forming tech community here. And that's when I started to sort of get more involved with all of the uh, uh, different tech companies that were here. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. that's a good evolution and it makes sense. How amazing that you were the first uh, app on there. I mean, that's a pretty fun anecdote. Yeah. It was called Conversation English and uh, it was a really great app. It was, um, it was based on 20 lessons and um, it was based around, it was sort of a soap opera. And so each <laughs> lesson was an ongoing uh, like piece narrative. of it. Yeah, yeah. Narrative where you were learning idioms based on this conversation of these uh, four characters uh, re revolving around a relationship. So you were learning English based on these idioms and also following the storyline from lesson to lesson. And um, uh, the uh, the lessons were written in California. They were edited in, in um, Vancouver. The illustrations were done in the Philippines. The audio was done in New York. The uh, graphic design was done in Winnipeg and the uh, code was done in India. Uh, it was all sort of put together uh, and uh, it came together in that short time. 
That does sound like a huge project though. So for you to like take that risk, the app store is maybe going to exist. You're already kind of working on this thing to be right out the gate. That seems like a pretty big tech undertaking for someone who kind of self-proclaimed doesn't come from that background. <laughs> I, I was really nervous to do that uh, app. Um, uh, first of all, we couldn't find any developers at first right after the announcement had come out that there was this app store. Uh, and then I ended up finding a, a Google ad for a company in India that says that they do C++ uh, coding, mm -hmm. uh, which was the, 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 the type of code that was needed uh, for apps at the time. And um, I emailed the person and, uh, or the company, and then somebody emailed me back with a number and said to give them a call. I ended up calling this guy in India who was the CEO of this. It was a fairly large uh, development company, but they were not doing apps at the time. They were doing other things, uh, but they wanted to get into it um, and they wanted to sort of experiment with it. They hadn't made any yet, um, but they believed that they could. And uh, so the guy on the other end of the line said, it'll cost $10,000. And uh, he said, wire me 5,000 today and we'll get started tomorrow. And that was a lot of money for us back then because we were still pretty small. Yeah. And it was, I think at the time there was only three people at our company. And so I sort of walked around um, uh, the office for about two or three hours, just humming and hawing as to whether I should go do this. And I ended up going down to the bank later that day and figured like the most I'm going to lose here is 5,000 on this because I really didn't even know this person. Right. Uh, and I sent it to him and uh, he emailed the next day and said, we received your funds and we're going to get working on this. And uh, a month later, we had our, our app uh, uh, developed. And luckily this ends well where it was all legitimate. Yeah, it ended we really are. well. And we yeah. ended up building a good relationship with this company and building several apps with them mm -hmm. over time. Yeah. yeah. It, it's really interesting now. Like there's a, there's a lot of people that say that we there is amazing, intelligent, smart, like tech talent all over the world, mm -hmm. but there's not necessarily job opportunities that match that are amazing for all this talent all over the world. And so sometimes like if we can give the, those, those amazing opportunities to build really cool things to people in other countries, like it's, it's really positive because, and for everyone wins because you've now also got access to really great talent across the other side of the world. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, as we grew as a company, I, I really did want to try to grow this company here in Winnipeg mm -hmm. and, um, uh, to, to build an office here. And we did, we opened an office, uh, in the exchange and the intent was to continue to grow as much as our, uh, as much of our company here locally. Um, um, but it became more evident too that um, to build a great company nowadays, you do need talent all over the world. Um, and so we we try to keep a balance of hiring people here locally uh, and uh, where we can't find the talent locally, we'll, we'll either outsource or also try to bring people into the city. So we've had an initiative to bring uh, people from other countries uh, into, uh, into Manitoba, into Winnipeg, both on the, um, the provincial nominee program and the federal, federal program as well. Yeah, that's great because then too, we've got, we're bolstering our economy. You're able to stay here because you've got now the talent that you need to run your business here. Mm -hmm. So that, that all sounds like, like really great. And I'm wondering when you, when we were talking just now about kind of the app development and things like that, you, you know, you, you said you had a few different apps over the years and now you have a lot of that tech integration, like right into your website itself. What's, what are you guys working on now with kind of customizing what kind of content gets provided to the teachers who are using it? What's that piece, that integration look like? Yeah, so we we ended up uh, pausing all the apps that we we were doing, and to and we just put all of our focus into ESL Library, which is a subscription model, um, and that was really uh, the product that we were sort of most in love with. And th this product, as I was saying before, it was it was primarily a content library, uh, but as the content library grew and grew, uh, it became more challenging for teachers to find. Uh, the right content on our platform. So it doesn't matter if you have 100 lessons on the platform or 10,000 lessons on the platform. If you can't sort of navigate to the right content at the right time, it's irrelevant of how much content you actually have. Mm -hmm. And so as we sort of amassed uh, this large amount of content that we had built up and, and written over the years, um, it became evident that the, the most important thing moving forward is being able to uh, provide teachers with the most accurate and most relevant content at the right time. Um, so that involves uh, things like just better navigation, better filtering, better sorting, better search, and then also uh, being able to uh, curate content to teachers and, and, and in a more uh, technical way, uh, building algorithms to be able to uh, assess 
uh, both uh, sort of the needs of the teachers and the needs of the students. So looking at attributes and profiles of students and of teachers and then results of uh, teachers and students, or not teachers, but the results of students and how they're doing in a particular task and be able to recommend uh, content that will keep them moving on a, um, uh, a more progressive uh, path forward. Wow. So now it's so, quite interactive. The teacher can actually put in some of that information of kind of their students and, and a bit of that to, to be able to target the content. Yeah. So, I mean, we're, we're just still in the early stages of all of this technology, but right, right now when a student signs up, uh, they start doing tasks immediately and we start logging mm. the data of that, uh, uh, the results of, of how they're doing. Um, and the intent is that, um, the, you know, sort of the more data that we can build up and the, the more we can look at different cohorts of students and see that, you know, maybe 80% of students who have this profile are struggling with this grammar structure, but uh, ones who uh, did this lesson first seem to progress faster. Well, then we can recommend this type of lesson uh, right. ahead. So th that's where we're headed right now to be able to provide a, a much more personalized experience for teachers. Uh, let them do the teaching and take away the time it takes to sort of find the right content. Yeah, it's all about the data, right? To be able yeah. to do all that. Yeah, and we didn't have very much data pre-COVID because um, it was a it, it was a challenge to get teachers to move away from the PDF towards the digital tools that we had been building uh, prior to um, prior to COVID. We had about. 170,000 homework tasks completed uh, between 2018 and 2019 over two year period. And then during COVID, we've seen that spike from 170,000 tasks to 15 million uh, homework tasks completed uh, since last March. Did your site crash at some point? Like how it, did you change that <laughs> dramatically? It, it did crash. We yeah. were very, very stressed last March and March of 2020. Um, we were stressed as everybody was stressed uh, um, when COVID was really starting to, to take hold. Uh, stressed for reasons of not knowing or understanding what might happen to the business, not knowing how many of our schools that subscribe to us could you know, go bankrupt. We really didn't know. So we had that kind of stress. And then we had the stress of trying to um, accommodate all of these teachers who were moving online and were expecting uh, something to work. And suddenly having, you know, millions of tasks completed um, on a server that wasn't ready for that. You know, right, we weren't ready to scale at that. That's capacity. a dramatic shift. Yeah, it was, it, it, we had a lot of, a lot of crashes at that time. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of late nights and uh, yeah. I can only imagine. So, I mean, let's talk about that for a minute. You're a business owner. You've done the right thing to pivot. It's exciting that you have this online platform being built, but there are days that things will just go wrong. How do you, as a business owner, keep your kind of mental health in place? How do you keep the team excited and moving forward when there is like a lot of stress going on? Um, well, I think in terms of keeping the team motivated, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot about just making sure that people know and understand the purpose and the vision of why we're doing this. Um, and, and to, to not stress out so much, to not, it's, it's, I used to think it was really, you know, crucial that, um, uh, that we could never, ever let a customer down. And, and I still feel that way. Uh, but I try to carry that burden for everybody now and not put that burden on, uh, on the team. It's, mm -hmm. it's important to just let the team keep, uh, working and to keep them calm and to keep them, uh, to keep them motivated and excited about, uh, building something new and something great and to not, uh, every time that there's a crash, uh, or every time that there's something that goes wrong to not try to bring that up. Uh, in a negative way, but rather to to just work to solve it as quickly right. as possible. So we were constantly solving things and constantly putting out fires um, over the past year. And it was very stressful for people, but what what would have made it much worse, I think, is to to put a lot of pressure on everybody to uh, to really um, uh, to pull through uh, instead of just letting them do their thing and 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 getting them to do it on their own. Yeah. Yeah. What else do you think that this period of time taught you? Like, what do you feel like you got out of it at the end if you look back a bit retrospectively? This period of COVID? Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, Business related, of course, like with everything we we're just talking about here. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's just, it's such an interesting time. Um, I, I've see, I, I have a lot of uh, friends uh, who, have, uh, who have businesses who have 
you know, not seen that uptick in the same way. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's important to remember that, you know, a lot of what's happened to ed tech right now, um, it was coming anyways, ed tech was always going to grow and expand and explode. But, you know, a lot of uh, what has happened over the last year or so has been luck. And uh, it's important to remember that too, because you can, we've, we've got good luck right now, but we could have bad luck down the road and you have mm -hmm. to be anticipating that and not just think that this was all uh, 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 so fortunate for us, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, to remember that. Is it hard to manage how many staff you should be hiring because you've got this spike, so you need the talent, but you don't want to over hire because in case it doesn't last as things go back to normal, has that been a, an issue at all across your mind? Yeah, a little bit. Um, I mean, I think we we know we want to keep growing and we know regardless of COVID, uh, ed technology in the classroom is now never going to go back. Like uh, the, 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 the one great thing about uh, all of this for, for tech, for ed tech, is that it, it forced teachers to try something uh, that they didn't really want to try in the past. They were um, or, or, or were hesitant to. And now that they've come to, to grow used to it, um, now they're more demanding of like, great quality educational technology in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think we're going to go back. So I'm not as nervous about, uh, about hiring too many people and then the industry is going to scale down. Mm -hmm. I know that the industry in, in education technology is going to continue to, to progress. Uh, but it, it was also, you know, as I was saying a minute ago, we didn't know how many schools might just shut their doors and because we, we, we have both, you know, public schools and universities, but we also sell to, um, to conversational schools and, uh, excuse me, private language schools. And they depend on people coming from overseas uh, to come into their school for, you know, a few months and then go back home. A lot of those schools shut down and, um, and we did lose that kind of business, but other ones uh, grew and other online ones grew. Yeah, so um, wasn't so concerned about the number of staff uh, but was certainly concerned about just what might happen to the industry. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think the evolution of the ed tech industry is a really interesting one. And like you say, the last year or so certainly catapulted that. Yeah. I know locally there are some organizations too, like Tech Manitoba included, who do a lot of work around digital literacy and like helping people who don't have those base computer skills. Right. Oftentimes there is a parallel between new Canadians or new immigrants who also may, who have language barriers and also may have technical skill barriers. Like their right. digital literacy skills are maybe not there yet based on just the nature of how, where and how they were raised, what access they had. Um, have you seen that at all? Do you, like, what's your, what's your take or understanding of what's going on in that world of things? Um, well, we don't focus as much on that, but we have, uh, in, in more recent years, we have started to develop uh, content for uh, literacy, uh, for new immigrants who are coming here at, at sort of that almost like even pre-literacy uh, levels. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, uh, what we found is that uh, you know, it's not just a matter of teaching the language, but also just being able to use a keyboard or send an email. Some of these things have never even been done uh, by many of the students that are coming into that program. Yep. And so we have, uh, we have in more recent years, um, uh, started to create some content that does focus on not just literacy, but digital literacy as well. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just starting to evolve on our platform. Well, I think it's just something that's been brought to light a little bit more in the last mm. year. So it's great that you're looking at it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we have a whole new flashcard section, I think, that's just um, strictly dedicated to digital literacy. So bringing mm. up, you know, pictures of, um, of mute buttons and uh, a camera uh, hide or, or turn on or turn off uh, right. buttons and things like that. So they're learning yeah. the language at the same time as learning some of the functionality. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, that's great. And, and going to be so important as we continue to um, see the move to more online tech services. And this is really for every business out there, right? Yeah, um, for sure. Yours just, there is a, definitely an overlap between like a lot of the people that are accessing your service and probably that, yep. that group that needs some of those skills. So that's awesome that you're looking at it. Um, now, we were talking about kind of working with schools and, and school divisions and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, there's a lot of people who wonder, who have products they think that schools might want, but it's a bit of a different relationship to get into a school because they have different processes and different kind of rules of who they work with. What's, the, your, what's your take on, on how best to work with schools and school divisions? You know, we've been doing this for... Uh 
close to 20 years now, and I still don't have an answer to that. <laughs> I really don't. Um, uh, you know, it's it's different in every school district that you go to. It's very difficult, and it's actually becoming far more difficult to get into schools now mm. if you have a if you have a technology product. It's easier if you're just selling a book, um, but if you have a technology product and you're trying to get into schools. Um, you're not just trying to make the sale to the administrator or the, the program coordinator, but you're also trying to pass a number of tests for the technology, the security, the privacy. Right. Right. And uh, just to become a vendor, um, uh, you have to jump through many hoops or you have to make sure that your platform is uh, really, really uh, uh, up, up to date. Um, and then in, in the States, they have all new types of regulation uh, about purchasing. We sell a lot to the States. So about 27% of our customers are, or teachers are in the U.S. About 23% are in Canada and the other 50% are spread out around the world. But uh, in the U.S., um, it's becoming more and more difficult, more and more challenging to sell to schools. Uh, more and more regulation, uh, more and more Buy America um, uh, uh, initiatives kind of there as well. Yeah. 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 So if you don't, in some cases, if you don't have uh, an American company set up, you're not even allowed to sell uh, to the schools. They're not allowed uh, to buy from you. Even if you. you're their choice, they're yeah, not even allowed if, to. Yeah, even if you're their choice, they're not allowed to buy from you. Mm -hmm. So we've seen that more and more in the last few years. We're curious if that's going to change now with the new administration or not. It seems like maybe not. Uh, but certainly in the previous four years, it went from um, being fairly easy to get in to being quite difficult. Interesting. So, and so a lot of it might be kind of already on paper, like they're deciding for you, perhaps if you're allowed to work with them or not, they've got a checklist of the safety mm -hmm. kind of aspects to it, which I think it is really important. Um, especially if people are building products where they're maybe not thinking about that, if they yeah. want to be in this domain, really, we need to start thinking about that, right. you know, to those listeners out there creating things that might be used by all ages. Um, yeah. But what about you know, actual like relationships just built off of who you are and trust. Like, is that a part of it or is it really checklist based? No, no, it's, uh, I think relationship is really important. Um, so one of the ways that we grew in Canada, um, we, we don't have a sales team at our company. Um, and, but one of the ways that we grew in Canada was we started flying out to schools across Canada. Uh, and we would call up an administrator and we would say that we are working on some new content and we'd like to show it to you and get your opinion on it. Uh, do you have an hour for us to come in? We wouldn't make it a sales call. We would just say, we'd like to show it to you. And if you think that it's good, then we'd like to give you a license for as long as you want for free to try it out. Um, or we'd also like to tweak it uh, in a way that might work with your, uh, with your teacher's needs. And we ended up getting um, uh, meetings with Toronto District School Board, Toronto Catholic, Peel District School Board, some of the biggest school boards in the country um, uh, allowed us to come in and show our product. And we built these really close and strong relationships, um, which I consider to be real and true uh, relationships, long lasting ones. Um, and I feel almost like close with these uh, administrators now over the years. And a lot of the content that we ended up building and creating was a, a result of like meeting people in person and um, and and just finding out what they want and what they need, as mm -hmm. opposed to coming in and trying to just sell the product that you think that they need. And so a lot of the material that we have right now uh, on our site is directly related to sitting down with the customer on the other end and asking them what they want before we build it um, and then build it. And, and that's really paid off for us quite a bit. Yeah. And that's such a lovely anecdote. And I think in that case, then you're building a product that people truly love and it probably makes you more passionate about what you're building. Yeah, it does. It's, it's more rewarding on all ends. And, and for the teachers and administrators, they feel great too, because they sort of play a role in um, shaping the product that they're using. You know, they know that we're listening and they, they know that we're pivoting almost daily to their needs. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're reacting to the needs and we're listening. Uh, you know, if we put a lesson out, and we get some feedback the next day that um, this was a little confusing or you were missing this or you were missing that, typically we'll make a change if it seems reasonable that we've missed something or haven't thought about something, we'll make a change pretty quickly and we'll get it out there and we'll respond to them. Mm -hmm. And so they know that, um, that what they're saying we're hearing and uh, that's a great feeling for them as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, on that note, we're going to jump into our speed round, Ben. Okay. So whatever first pops to mind, and we're just going to get right yeah, into I it. Yeah, I think I'm going to fail at this part. No, okay. You just, whatever pops to mind, you just <laughs> say it, all right? Okay, describe yourself in a word or two. 
Um, calm and super stressed. <laughs> Both great. What motivates you? Uh, what motivates me is uh, just doing something really great for the customer. What keeps you up at night? Uh, the site crashing. <laughs> Who's the most influential person for you who has been? Oh, geez. John Prine. Okay. <laughs> he's, okay. he, he's, a, he's a folk singer. <laughs> yes. What is one thing in business that you're so happy you did? Um, I'm so happy that I went into business. I'm so happy that I, that I took the step to do it. That's a great answer. What is most important for your mental health? Um, to, to break away from, uh, work. It's a really hard thing to do. And, uh, I, I don't do a good job of it, but uh, that's the most important thing. Yeah. What is one thing you've been wrong about? Uh, everything. <laughs> good. Learn as we go. <laughs> uh, how do you personally continue to learn and grow? Uh, from listening, uh, to our staff, uh, and, uh, from our customers. Where are you in 10 years? Uh, in 10 years, I think that we're going to be one of the biggest uh, ed tech companies in language learning in the world. Awesome. And we'll shout you out from here <laughs> in Manitoba. Uh, what does being a great leader mean to you? Uh, it means uh, making sure that the, the people who, uh, who work at our company and who are on our team love what they do and love being a part of the company. That's our speed round. Okay. You actually did great, Ben. <laughs> Thanks. Self-deprecating there at the beginning. <laughs> you did really good. Really good. Um, so... You know, I love kind of coming back to a few of these answers and I'll, I'll bug you about the one of taking time for yourself because I think it's just important to call out on a show like this, right? We talk to a lot of entrepreneurs on this show and people forget to do that, you know, myself included. I think when you have a lot of responsibility and people and you have your business, how do you, how do you actually take that time to stop? Like, have you made rules for yourself and maybe you just don't follow them, but. <laughs> um, I, I pretend to make rules for myself. I just, <laughs> I have rules for myself, but I break them right. far too often. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I think maybe up until about four years ago, I was always working sort of 12 hours days. I would work on the weekends too. I'd always have my phone in my hand. Um, but I have kids now and uh, it really makes me sad when I do that. I feel really badly when, mm -hmm. I, uh, when I do that, when I'm drawn to the screen versus drawn to the time with my children. So I'm, uh, it, it's really, really important to be able to, to break apart from that. Otherwise, what's the point? Yeah. Especially as we work in technology, right? Because we know the like psychological impacts of the tech that we're all using and interacting yeah. with all the time. And it's becoming more public knowledge too, but you know, firsthand we know yeah. what we're creating with our user and user experience, <laughs> That's right? right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so for you, like over this period of time, your business evolves, you evolve as well with it. What would you say that your personality has kind of changed over time too? Like clearly you always were a hard worker. That's, that's in you. What would you say about that? Uh, about the personality changing? Yeah. Um, I don't know if my personality has changed. I think, um, I think a lot of people just stay as they are, but I think you just get better at managing certain things, you mm -hmm. know? So, uh, I don't necessarily think my personality has changed, but I think that maybe I've gotten better at managing the stress uh, of running a business. And, yeah. uh, so that's not a change to the personality. It's just a, uh, a better management, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and you said too, that you, you take the time to like learn from your staff, learn from your clients when it comes to internally, do you have to put practices in place to get obvious feedback from your staff? Or is it as simple as just listening when they're talking? Um, like to be a good leader, it's, it's some good tips here probably for other people listening and leading teams. I think I'm still, I'm still trying to figure it out. I don't, I don't think I know nearly enough about being uh, a leader. I think, uh, I think there's a lot still to learn. Um, I think I knew how to be a leader when we were a smaller team, but we grew very quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, just a couple of years ago, we were, uh, uh, about two and a half years ago, we were about six people. And then we were about 13, two years ago, uh, about a year ago, we were 20 and now we're, uh, approaching 40 people. And that happened really quickly. So knowing and understanding how to lead a bigger team like that is still, that's pretty new to me. Mm -hmm. And I'm learning as I go. But I think the important thing is, is to pay attention and to, and to be open to learning and to not just to sort of assume that you know everything you're doing. I think actually when we first transitioned to become a tech company a, a couple of years ago, I did think I knew 
what I was doing because uh, I, we were pretty successful in outsourcing the development of technology. And I assumed that that would mean that we could do the same internally or that I knew how to run a team internally, but I didn't. It took, a, it took a, really a couple of years to, to understand how to do that mm -hmm. uh, internally. Especially if you're building like the pieces you're outsourcing are probably the more technical pieces. You've got team coming to you now with questions. You have to know how to answer those questions, but if they're tech related, it's hard. Yeah, but even the bigger thing, like I wasn't answering the tech questions. The, the bigger thing was how to structure a technical team. Right. I didn't know how to put a team together. I didn't know how to create a um, uh, sort of, you know, uh, how that team might look with a project manager and uh, different roles in that team. I really didn't understand anything about that because mm -hmm. that was what was always being done by another company, right? Yeah. So I understood how to, you know, wireframe uh, the product that we wanted and, and explain to the other companies what we wanted. Uh, but that didn't mean that we knew how to build a team internally. Do you have but any I kind of secrets or tips now having... Well, I would it? say that uh, that you should lean on other people to learn that. Um, so I didn't realize as well that I could lean on other people to sort of help me with that. And eventually, uh, a, a really great friend of mine had just left his job as a CTO of a really big tech company, and he was sort of transitioning between roles. And he was looking to do some consulting because when he was the CTO at this at this tech company, that company would hire these coaches and um, uh, sort of mentors to help their executive staff uh, learn how to become better at their jobs. And he realized that, you know, he had some of that skill too. So he was starting that, uh, that type of job, uh, freelance job for a little while between uh, jobs. And we ended up hiring him to be a coach uh, for us, both at the management level and on team level. And I found that once we started to have a coach uh, or a mentor uh, teach us some of the things that we were missing, we, we very quickly picked that up and were able to, to start to build teams in a better way. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And at and this point now, I know too that you kind of take pride in hiring the right people and the best people to now help with all that work. What tips would you have for someone who wants to ensure that they're getting the best hires, that they're actually putting time and energy like into getting the strongest team together? Um, well, there's that expression, hire, hire, hire slow, fire fast. <laughs> right. Uh, yep. So, um, uh, but the, the, the crucial part of that is the hire slow. Um, uh, we hired way too fast in the beginning, I think, um, uh, just assuming that uh, anybody with a certain skill level could do the job. But it's not just the skill level, it's, it's the personality, it's understanding if those people can work well with the rest of your team and are really dedicated to the product or have a real interest in the product, really want to see it through. So there's a lot of uh, aspects to hiring that go beyond just the skill level. Uh, and, and that's really important. And that's something that we've come to learn over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, as we were starting to grow, we really didn't know that, but we've hired a lot of people in the last uh, year or so. And I'd say that uh, everybody that we've hired um, uh, is really exceptional. And we're really, really happy with the team that we have right now. That must feel yeah. good. Yeah, it feels great. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, you, you were alluding to the fact that like, as you grow, leadership does kind of change because your company is constantly changing internally. Mm -hmm. Do you have best practices around keeping a good culture or, or what you've seen as an, what you've learned as, as your cultures evolve? Because there is such yeah. a different feeling when, as the team grows rapidly. Yeah. And we're trying to figure that out right now too, because now we're completely remote um, and we will probably stay that way for a while. So now you're not only, you know, before you were trying to sort of create a culture in the office, um, you know, going out for drinks after, uh, after work or having certain things happen during the day or lunch gatherings um, and uh, a certain vibe you want to set in the office. But now it's very different to do it all online. And uh, it's challenging because um, there's this sort of solitary, like loneliness that everybody feels um, even though they're connected all the time together. Uh, I think it's important that uh, if you are going to be online a lot, that, uh, that you break away from work sometimes and do fun games and fun activities and do sort of uh, workshops that have nothing to do with work at all. Um, and that also, it's also important, I think, to, uh, to give people a break. So like, for example, we were talking the other day, just a few days ago, and um, uh, 
we just sort of thought that, you know, everybody's tired and everybody's burnt out from COVID. So let's just like give everybody a paid day off this Friday. Let's just cancel work. And I think we should do that more often. You know, we should just uh, put people in a position where they don't feel like um, work is everything. Uh, mm -hmm. And that the company is everything. That it's really important to uh, to to get people to know that there's this balance, and that they shouldn't feel like um, uh, that their jobs are everything. Uh, that there's their outside life that's uh, that's more important. And um, I think if you can if you can get that point across, there'll be this sort of re more relaxed culture in your in your workspace, and people will just come there and really do their best. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like a different level of respect and appreciation when they know that they're being supported in return. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If you're not trying to hijack their whole lives, uh, then I think that um, their life at work will be a much more balanced one and a, and a more relaxed one, and you'll get a lot better output from that as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Talk to me about what you've seen as a change in productivity since allowing kind of the whole team to work from home since since moving to that kind of company. There's different camps on this. Do you feel yeah. like it's exactly the same productivity, higher, lower? Have you seen a difference? Um, yeah, I have seen a difference. Um, you know, prior to that, we had this weird um, mix because we half of our team was in Winnipeg and the other half were freelancers in other cities. Mm -hmm. And so the team that was in Winnipeg were all at an office together. Mm -hmm. And we had rules that you would come in and you would work at the office. And if you wanted to work from home, you needed to ask. And we never said no to working from home, but you needed to let us know that you were going to work from home. Um, and I think that um, we always just sort of assume that if you were working from home, uh, from the the Winnipeg staff that you might work differently. You might work much better in the office, even though there were people in other cities who were working from home. Now. The people in other cities were primarily writers and editors where they should be working from home anyways. Uh, it's more dedicated tasks. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and they need a quieter space and it's uh, it's less collaboration for most of the time. There's a lot of collaboration for the writers and editors, but then there's a lot of like alone time that you really need uh, and you can't have the distractions. Um, and then in the in the office in Winnipeg was more of our customer support and our technical staff. But to answer your question, um, uh, we assumed that it was a better uh, or a better uh, output if we were all working together in the office. We actually saw the opposite happen. Uh, people were far more productive once they started working from home. And um, uh, we've been very happy with it. Now, the one thing that I regret, though, is that there isn't chance for people to come together sort of once a week and collaborate in person because that connection in person is really important. So I think if you're going to be a remote team, at minimum, once COVID is over, you start uh, putting a budget aside to take your staff on a retreat, maybe twice a year, and everybody at least gets together in person uh, at some point. Because it is kind of sad if you work together for many years and never actually see the people in person. Yeah, they do say that at the end of the day, no matter how much good you can do in an online environment, that the strength of the relationship, as soon as you meet even one time in person, is just that much more exponential, is, is kind of, I think, what the research is showing. I think so. And yeah. it just seems obvious. So that's, uh, that's something that we're planning for right now. We'd like to start doing biannual retreats, mm -hmm. somewhere fun, maybe a ski trip, maybe a trip to Palm Springs, maybe a trip to Europe, who knows. Uh, but something where everybody can just like have a great week or a few days all yeah. together. Yeah. Well, that's a pretty good plug there. So if anyone's looking for a new job, you want to <laughs> check if ESL Library is hiring because they're going to have some very cool perks <laughs> in the future or two <laughs> retreats. Yeah. yeah. That's good. And that's one of the benefits of not having an office, I guess, right, too. So you can put that money towards things like that. Right? Yeah. So yeah. Because you understand retreats. the difference in the overhead that you're saving yeah. and, and some of those aspects. Yeah. And also there is a difference um, supposedly in kind of sick days and things like that, because people, if you do allow them that work-life balance as well, um, because when you're working from home, people tend to like take that proper time to eat a little bit better or things like right. that. You're closer to being able to work out because you don't have your commute and things like that. So supposedly we should be seeing also a change in the number of like sick days or days off that people require, which right. also saves the company money. Yeah. So there's another benefit yeah, we can definitely. add to the pile. And you know, with respect to like sick days and holidays, so we've always had a policy that there's unlimited sick days. There's, there's, it doesn't matter if you're sick, you shouldn't work and uh, we shouldn't be checking that off. And if you're sick so many days, then it's probably something serious and, uh, and you need to be looked after. So we're not counting sick days. We don't worry about that. We try to give uh, really good holidays. 
uh, as well. And, um, but, but certainly like, I think working at home to your point, um, maybe you can be in better shape and you can take care of yourself more because Mm -hmm. there's an opportunity there to eat better at home and, um, and to just stay healthier. Yeah. Go for walks during lunch. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Whereas before, maybe you felt like you couldn't leave the office because it was trickier or you didn't have the right shoes because you're downtown or whatever the case might be. Yeah. Yeah. So that's exciting. And I think, I mean, it sounds like you've clearly thought about a lot of those things up front as far as like making a good culture as much as you're modest about kind of the evolution over time. It sounds like you put a lot of good bones in place. It seems like we're getting there. I think we've still got a lot to learn about culture, uh, but mm. we're getting there and I think there's a pretty good culture at our, at our company. Yeah. Well, and I know that you're doing a little bit too to find a way to get your product into the hands of maybe schools or people that, um, that may not otherwise be able to access it, maybe affordability-wise. Yeah. Tell me a bit about that because that can also tie into employee morale when they know that you're doing really great things for the community at the same time. Yeah. Well, you know, we've always kept our prices as low as we possibly could uh, because quite, quite frankly, like teachers, whether they're in a school with a budget or not, uh, have really, really low budgets. And, um, so you don't want to price them out. There was, when software first came on the market for education, you know, coming in like the form of CD-ROMs or, uh, eventually online, um, a lot of bigger companies took the approach of let's really price this really high. You know, let's charge $2,000 a year per teacher, or let's charge a hundred dollars a year per student. And it would sort of break the bank. So we always have uh, priced our product really low, as low as we possibly could, uh, because you don't have to price high uh, for software. You know, uh, your costs are your servers and your and your staff. Um, and it, there's nothing to ship. There's nothing to stock. Nothing to store. Um, and uh, there's an opportunity to price low to begin with. And so we've tried to keep it as low as we could while still being able to maintain a a good viable business. Uh, but then there are still some schools where they will never be able to afford um, any uh, technology in the classroom um, uh, that are struggling, you know, a lot in developing countries uh, or just uh, in e- even, even, you know, certain uh, areas uh, in Canada and the U.S. where there are uh, sort of nonprofits that are trying to do something great um, and they've got, you know, absolutely no budget, but they're trying to put a language program together maybe for new refugees. So our initiative, you know, moving forward, we've always... Uh, typically done donation subscriptions to anybody who asks if they can't afford it will uh, will will we'll donate subscriptions um, but we'd also like to get to a point where we are intentionally uh, running a program that is sort of seeking out um, uh, sort of giveaways to give uh, subscriptions to schools uh, mm-hmm. around the world that need it you know perhaps on that model of every time we gain a new school district we look to give one away uh, to a school that can't afford it, to, to a nonprofit that can't, aff- can't yeah. afford it. Yeah. That's great. And it sounds like you're really doing a lot of things to kind of move in that direction with all of the advancements that ESL Library is working <laughs> on. So Ben, what's next? What's the future for ESL Library for you? Um, well, again, the future for ESL Library is all about personalized learning. That's where our focus is right now. We're really excited about that, being able to, to deliver a far more personalized experience to both the, the teacher and the learner. Uh, for me personally, I uh, just hope to start traveling with my family again yeah. and, uh, and see what happens next. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Ben, that's our show today. Thank you okay. so much for coming on. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Oh, my Thanks God. for inviting me. You're welcome. If you're looking to start or grow your big idea, catch more episodes like this one right here. Be sure to comment below, follow us on social, and don't forget to subscribe to the show. Just click the subscribe button here below, and every two weeks, we'll release a new episode with inspiring conversations and tips just for you. Thanks for watching.